That beautiful song, some of you, that's your favorite one. Oh, holiness. We talked about maybe we, we, it didn't seem so holy as it was messy and um, probably not like it we sing about. But in the midst of all that mess, there was great hope. The Savior had been born. I saw a picture Barb showed to me, Ruth Fuller had put on social media uh, about what it might have been like, and it had a, a young teenager, a mom, just laying on the ground exhausted, and the dad just sitting going like, what's going on, you know? And that's probably more what it was like that night. It probably wasn't this holy night where the stars were brightly shining, as we like to sing about. The hope was born. Last week we looked at another familiar carol, Come All Ye Faithful, and we talked about when we first came to Jesus. You shared with one another what drew you, what moved you towards Jesus in the very beginning. I think that's helpful to us as we enter this Christmas season. What drew you to the Lord in the very first place? And do you still continue to come to Him? Oh, come all ye faithful. We talked about joyful and triumphant. Great words to have on our tombstone, wouldn't it be? <coughs> joyful, triumphant. We talked about what's it mean to live a triumphant life. That's kind of a weird language. We don't usually use that language. And we, we sort of discussed to be triumphant. A lot of times, to be triumphant, you have to someone, have someone come alongside you. Whether that's at work or whether that's at a sports team, to be triumphant in life, I think you need someone to come alongside you. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It helps us live confident, triumphant lives. So come all you be joyful and triumphant. Mm -hmm. We receive that someone at Christmas. Today we let another familiar hymn take us to the manger and the birth of Jesus, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Last week was probably my favorite. This week is probably one of my least favorites. Don't know why. If that's your favorite, good. I'm glad it is. But it's just not, my, just not real exciting. We sang it earlier today, and the words of the song were, were meaningful. But it just kind of, I think it was just kind of slow and moving. And I want something a little more peppy. You know? Oh, Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Just, it just isn't one of my favorites. I'd rather sing... Baby, it's cold out. <laughs> and Paul in the news, that's been in the news every day. We won't go with there with that one, but we'll stick with the uh, old town of Bethlehem. It was written by a six foot six inch pastor 150 years ago. Six foot six, Phillips Brooks. In 1865, Brooks went to the Holy Land, which would have been an interesting way to trip way back 150 years ago to the Holy Land. It's interesting now, but can you imagine 150 years ago what that would have been like? And he went to a Christmas Eve service at Bethlehem's Church of the Nativity, which is the traditional site of Jesus' birth. Three years later, he is doing a children's program, much like we had Wednesday night, and he needed a song for it. And so this six-foot-six-inch pastor, with his trip to the Bethlehem being his inspiration, he penned a little town I'm glad things have changed. I'm sure our kids own is glad things have changed, that Pastor Brian doesn't have to write a song for the children's Christmas program. This pastor's glad. But this Phillips Brooks, since book six, was a, a big man, wrote this song for the children. He loved children. In fact, he passed away, and when they told the church, a little five-year-old, this is a story that I read about, said, when they told that he passed away, she said, the angels are going to be so happy. Pretty cool little story. So Phillips Brook wrote this song. Why Bethlehem? Have you ever wondered why Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Why not Jerusalem? That was a, a bigger place. Everybody would have noticed more. Bethlehem was this little village, really, of less than a thousand people. Someone said 300 to a thousand people live in. They had a right old little town of Bethlehem. It was a small town. Probably had a lot of stone houses. They said it had a wall surrounding it. It was in disrepair. It was crumbling. There was nothing special about Bethlehem. Nothing. Why? You know, too, this is where Ruth would have gleaned her fields. Interesting little information. Nothing special, but it is where God chose to have Jesus be born. Again, God's ways are not our ways. We'd have chosen a, a better spot. But way back in the beginning, early, Micah 5 2. But you, O Bethlehem the Prepta, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Bethlehem 
ifratha. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but that's not what we sing. Oh, little town of Bethlehem of Rabbah. We don't sing that. Where, where'd that come from? Did you know there were two? I didn't hear that. It was probably a good thing. So. There were two Bethlehems. Did you know that? There were two Bethlehems. One from north, one from south. Bethlehem of Rabbah, as predicted way back, way before, in Micah 5 2, in the prophets, he prophesied the specific place. Two Bethlehems in Israel. Just like there's more than one lady Smith in the United States. Anyone know where the other one is? Or at least one. I don't remember the one. Virginia. And then I believe there's one in, uh, or overseas somewhere. Or, uh, British Columbia, maybe? Yeah, that's what I have in my notes. Anyway, there was more than one Bethlehem. One was up north. Mary and Joseph lived near that. Another was about 75 miles south of Nazareth. Bethlehem and Parathah. God was very specific. Way back even when the, the uh, prophet said, He will be born in Bethlehem and Parathah. Does it even matter which Bethlehem Jesus would be born in? Luke 2 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Yes, it does matter. The city of death, Bethlehem was the city of David. Bethlehem of Prathah, the city where David was born. That's where David was anointed king of Israel. So there's a lot going on with this. God had a plan from the very beginning. Jesus, to be a Messiah, the promised one. All throughout the Old Testament, lots of prophecies about this. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We read that passage last week. That's triumphant talk. Joyful and triumphant. Triumphant language. The Messiah was to rule on David's throne. Israel knew all those things. So it did matter where he was born. Luke 1, 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. Remember on Palm Sunday? And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. God had a plan. I'm impressed the more I learn about all the details that God did to send his son Jesus. It was purposeful. It was intentional. It was more than a cute story. Am I surprised by all the details that God did and accomplished from the Old Testament to the birth? No. Am I awestruck? Yes. I am. All these things came to me at the right time, at the right place, at the right moment. Another thing that's really cool about Bethlehem is the meaning of the name. Anyone know what Bethlehem means? Bible names seem to have more importance than they do now. We're, we're sort of careful with how we choose names for our kids, but we like them to be strong and important names. But back then, names meant something Peter and Jacob. And some of them changed their names, and it was significant. <coughs> Bethlehem meant house of bread. Ephrathah meant fruitful. House of bread. Amazing that the bread of life is born in the house of bread. Jesus refers himself to the bread of life. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I don't know whether that was planned or not, but I'm impressed. The bread of life was born in the house of bread. The story is way more than an acute story or a cute nativity scene or a little manger. It was planned, it was predicted, it was intentional from the very beginning. More than a historical event. This is how God initiated change 
in the world to restore a people who had fallen away. <coughs> Jesus was born to be our bread. Who here doesn't love homemade bread? Just the smell makes you salivate. We received a, a loaf of bread earlier. Nothing better than homemade bread on toast with smothering butter. Is that the best? Even I can make that in my house. Even I. It's the best. We consume 34 million loaves of bread each day in America. That doesn't include all the specialties of croissants and bagels and all that, and donuts. Each person on average eats 50 pounds of bread each year, 53 I think exactly, on average. We're blessed. Other countries value bread even more than we do, and they have it at every meal. We probably don't even realize the significance, the importance. Bread has been a staple for many people. It's some of us are on bread. It's helped many survive. Maybe that gives us insight to what Jesus said, I am the bread of life. It's needed for survival. Just like we have a physical hunger, and yeah, you'll get lunch in a little bit. We have a spiritual hunger as well. What is it that only Jesus can satisfy when he says, I am the bread of life? I can satisfy. What, what is that? Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They will be satisfied. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. Never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Hunger and thirst. What are you hungry for today? We live in a world where children are hungry for acceptance. They'll do about anything to be accepted by Moms and dads, my peers, my friends, adults fall into the same thing. We long for acceptance. We deal with rejection sometimes, and sometimes we have people in our community who, after being rejected by those around them, can't believe God would accept them either. He would reject them too for their lifestyles. <coughs> They view God differently than us. Most of us probably have a, a picture of God as a loving God, a forgiving God. But so many people have a, a picture of him as being a judge, and, and rightly so. He is a judge. But judges are not very approachable. I've never had a friend that's a judge, but I can't imagine that they're like really fun to hang out with and do something with. They just don't seem to be like that. Maybe that's just my perception. The judges, they just don't have this aura about them that they're going to be fun. That they're going to be pointing a finger and you got to be careful. And that's how the world sees God. That's how the world sees Jesus as a judge. Unapproachable. They're just going to get in trouble if I hang out with them. A judge is there to do exactly that. Judge. That's their role. They don't have to be friends. They don't have to be compassionate. They're there to judge. They don't need you walking in the courtroom and giving them a high five and saying, hey, judge, how's it going? That wouldn't go over very well. <clears throat> the judge's job is to pass judgment. And certainly, God will fill that role. But I think Jesus came to help change that perception that he was more than just a judge. Came in the form of a baby. Babies are way more approachable. <clears throat> second service when we have babies, they sit in the back and guess where the big crowds are? They're around the baby. Whether it's before service or after service, everybody wants to hold the babies. They're approachable. Jesus came as judge, but he came as a baby. Approachable. Laughter. You can make weird noises at him and you can try to get him to smile. Babies are much more approachable. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He didn't send it just to condemn and judge the world, but to be the Savior. Jesus came to satisfy the hunger that we have to be accepted by Almighty God. 
read a story a few years back about a Willow Creek pastor who quit his job as pastor and spent two years doing an experiment, working at a coffee shop. He thought everybody was just hungry for something spiritual. He said, I came to the conclusion not everybody had that hunger. Some people are very content to live the life they are living. What about your friends, co-workers? Do they have a hunger? We like to think that there's this God-shaped hole in our lives that only God can fill, and I sort of get that, but not everybody. Some people are very satisfied and content with the way they're living their lives. Others have a hunger. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Our job is to love. Our job is to love. Can't change whether they're hungry or not. When Barb's hungry, sometimes I'm not hungry. I can't make her hungry when I'm hungry. I don't know if those in your life are hungry or not. Our job is to love. We're also hungry for forgiveness. Ever just blown it? Just dropped the ball? Just totally forgot something or totally on purpose did something wrong? And all you wanted was things to be made right. You wanted forgiveness. Kept you up at night, you wrestled in bed, you read, I mean, you and God, you had this argument, this person. You just want things right between the persons or the people that you let down and with God. You had this hunger to make things right. Ever been there? It was me a couple weeks ago when I wanted to make things right, where your pastor was not being a very good coach and was pretty harsh on some referees. It just so happened my wife was at the game. And she informed me. And I had already realized it before she had informed me of that. But here I am trying to teach these young guys how to play basketball, how to respect referees, how to treat people right. And Coach Chitwood was pretty harsh. More so than me did. And I laid there thinking, I need to talk to those boys. I need to make the right. I need to ask for forgiveness for them, and that's what I did before the next game. I said, I was out of line. I've refereed. Not much to be fun <coughs> on the inside. And what I did and how I approached them was disrespectful. So you won't see that again from me this season. But I was hungry to make it right because what I had done was wrong. Now, I've done a lot worse than y'all referees. And so we have a hunger to be made right with God. And we have peace with God. There's no better place on earth to be than to be at peace with God. God offers forgiveness. Jesus' birth was more than a story. It was his plan. It was intentional. It brought forgiveness. A sacrificial lamb was no longer needed. Jesus was the sacrifice for our sin. We have a hunger for forgiveness. Jesus was born to die. Not the prettiest of pictures, but that's the truth. It was intentional. I don't have the author of this, but found this. Compares the scene at the manger with the scene at the cross. There was no room for them in the inn, so they laid him in a wooden manger. Now there was not room for him in the hearts of men, so they hung him on a cross. And the bright star came and stood over the place where the child was as Jesus on the cross. Darkness fell on the whole land from the sixth to the ninth hour. Joseph and Mary wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger where no baby had ever been laid before. Now Joseph of Arimathea, being a good and righteous man, asked Pilate for the body of Jesus and wrapped him in a linen cloth and laid him in a tomb where no man had been laid before. All the shepherds came and adored him and went back praising and glorifying God. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what could take place, they beat their breasts and went away. One of them was a wise man. They brought myrrh as a gift of baby Jesus. Now Nicodemus brought myrrh as an ointment for the body of Jesus. The last thing the angels said to those shepherds on the hillside was peace on earth, goodwill towards men. The last thing Christ said to his disciples in the upper room was peace unto you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. 
offer similarities between the birth and the cross. Jesus came to show us that death is not the end. There is forgiveness. There is grace. The grave doesn't hold us. One day all the dead will rise. Lastly, and this was new to me this year, so if you're here, a little town of Bethlehem, the house of bread. Bethlehem was famous for one other thing, producing sheep that would be used for Passover. They were known for that. In fact, one author said maybe that's where Jesus was born, in a birthing place for sheep. I don't know if this is getting too cute or too weird or not. Immediately following the birth of a perfect lamb, the shepherds would inspect it. And upon finding a perfect one, they would wrap it in swaddling clothes so it wouldn't injure itself. Several sources agreed with that. God had a plan from the very beginning. His details are impressive. The bread of life, born in the house of bread, known where the Passover lambs could be bought, because Bethlehem was a place where the shepherds were. In fact, these were probably priestly shepherds doing just that. A baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. A lamb of God wrapped in swaddling clothes for you and for me. I don't know if that's getting too cute for you. But our God is impressive. He's detailed. He's creative. And Jesus was born not to be a cute little story. It was intentional for you and for me. A little town of Bethlehem. How still we see you are. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you had a plan from the very beginning. And the more we discover about the plan, the more we're humbled by the details. We don't know everything, we know this. You so love the world that you gave your one and only son. Thank you that you provide what we need, that you alone can satisfy. In fact, we've all tried many, many things that's left us empty. That you provide the bread of life. Fill our needs, our spiritual needs. Thank you for filling us. Help us to even crave and to hunger more for righteousness. Help us not to be spiritually in malnutrition. Thank you, too. You sent this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, the perfect lamb of God without spot or blemish for our sins. May we proclaim the good news any way we can. Would you stand? <coughs>